The Selfish Gene, Chapter 4, by Richard Dawkins. The Gene Machine. Having established the definition of what Dawkins means by genes in the previous chapter, Dawkins continues the story of evolution from the point he left off in Chapter 2 and delves into the evolutional behaviors within survival machines and its links to genes. As we know, under limited resources, survival machines compete for survival by finding novel ways to protect themselves, destabilize their rivals, and obtain food. With the depletion of the food source in the primeval soup, a branch of survival machines, now called plants, started to utilize sunlight to build complex molecules from simple ones. Animals, another branch of survival machines, exploited the labors of the plants by eating them or eating other animals. Both plants and animals evolved to become multicellular, finding new ways of survival, creating new ways of life in sub-branches, and specializing in living in different conditions. The sea, on the ground, in the air, underground, up trees, or inside the bodies of other survival machines. Sub-branching facilitated the creation of the diversity of species in plants and animals we see today. Dawkins describes the body as a colony of genes, although the behavior of survival machines seems to be individual, as a human or animal moves as a coordinated unit. He argues the communal nature of individual survival machines is unrecognizable because selection has favored genes that cooperated with each other. Central coordination is advantageous in the high stakes competition for survival. It is convenient, however, when speaking about altruistic or selfish behavior, to treat individual bodies as agents trying to maximize the survival of all its genes in future generations. Unlike plants, animals have evolved ways of moving hundreds of thousands of times faster than plants, with movements that are reversible and repeatable. Muscles have allowed rapid movement, which uses stored energy to generate mechanical movement. Survival machines use neurons and nerve cells to control the timing of muscle contractions. Eventually, dense concentrations of these nervous tissues become the ganglia, or in larger concentrations, became the brain. The brain became important for survival machines by controlling and coordinating movement. As movement is only advantageous if it matches with the events in the physical world, natural selection favored animals equipped with sense organs. There are some organisms where sense organs directly communicate with muscles, like in sea anemones, where this is efficient. However, in other species, the brain became an intermediary. Other than senses, the evolutionary invention of memory allowed muscle contractions to be influenced also by past events. Dawkins mentions that the most striking property of survival machines is that it behaves as if motivated by purpose. In other words, a purpose machine and which raises the question if they are actually conscious. Dawkins points to the analogy of a negative feedback machine, which has a measuring device that measures the discrepancy between the current state and desired state, and the machine will work harder to reduce this discrepancy. A modern example being like a guided missile. However, a common misconception is that because guided missiles are created by humans, they are under the immediate control of a conscious human being, or for example, computers programmed to play chess can only do what the human programmer tells it to do. Likewise, this is similar to the fallacy that genes can only directly control the behavior of their survival machines. Genes can control the survival machine only indirectly by setting up the machine and then sitting passively because of the time lag effect. To illustrate the fact of the gene's passivity, Dawkins takes an analogy from the science fiction book A for Andromeda by Fred Hoyle and John Elliott. In the novel, a civilization in the Andromeda constellation, 200 light years away, wants to spread its culture to distant worlds. The best way is to broadcast the signal in all directions like a radio wave and not waiting for a reply, instead of beaming it in one direction like a laser. Eventually the signal was picked up by humans on Earth and the instructions were decoded to build a giant computer. The computer turned out to be an artificial intelligence dictator that tried to take over the world, but fortunately it was stopped. The genes are both the Andromedans and the instructions themselves. Genes can control protein synthesis, but it is slow, for example it takes months to build an embryo, hence a time lag. 
On the other hand, behaviors are fast, and by programming in advance with rules and guidelines depending on the circumstances, genes instruct their survival machines in general strategies and tricks of living. The zoologist and neurophysiologist John Zachary Young stated that as an embryo is being built, genes have to predict what problems and dangers lie ahead. If a baby polar bear was born with a thick coat of white hair in the Arctic, its chances of survival would be high. But if Arctic conditions changed and the same bear was born in a tropical desert, the gene's prediction would be fatal. Hence, genes need to program behaviors that can improvise an average payoff. Gene survival is the currency of evolution, and all the genes in the colony agree on this priority. Another way to solve the prediction problem in unpredictable environments is to build a capacity for learning. For example, a list of rewarding things – sugar in mouth, sexual pleasure, mild temperature, smiling child. And nasty things – for example, pain, nausea, empty stomach, screaming child. The ability to learn helps predict the future and is done through running simulations. Survival machines such as humans do this by imagining the situation, alternative actions, and the consequences. Running simulations of the future gives an advantage over survival machines that can only learn through trial and error, which expends time, energy, and can often be fatal. Dawkins argues that a consequence of our evolution for the capacity to simulate possibly gave rise to the development of a subjective consciousness. He hypothesizes that perhaps consciousness arose when simulations of the world started to include a model of the survival machine itself. The evolutionary trend in the emancipation of survival machines from the genes was when survival machines started to act as executive decision makers. As we know from humans, survival machines can rebel and even refuse the rationale of the genes to have children. In this way, genes are like policy makers and the brains are the executive. Although eventually the brain becomes more highly developed and takes over more and more policy decisions to keep the machine alive. Animal behavior is under the control of genes, but only indirectly, but can still be very powerful. An example is foul brood, an infectious disease of the grub within honeybees. Different breeds of bees have varying susceptibility to it. Breeds that practice what is called hygiene behavior by pulling out the infected grubs from their cells and throwing them out of the hive can quickly stamp out the epidemic. W.C. Rothenbuehler studied hygiene behaviors of honeybees and found that hygiene genes were recessive but composed of two genes, one gene for uncapping the wax covering the grub and the other gene for throwing out the grub. Firstly, this illustrates how it is appropriate to speak of genes for behaviors, although we may be unclear on the mechanisms that cause that behavior and even if it turns out the chain of causes involve learning. Secondly, this illustrates how genes cooperate in their effect on behavior. The thrown out gene is only helpful if it is accompanied by the gene for uncapping, although the genes can journey separately through the generations. We should remember these points when we talk about genes for saving companions from drowning, and how we are not talking about the gene as the cause of all the complexity involved in saving someone from drowning. It is possible that a gene is more likely to make a body more likely to save someone than its allele. Dawkins points out that an important behavior to discuss is a behavior of communication, which he broadly defines as when a survival machine influences another's behavior or the state of its nervous system. As survival machines may boost their own welfare by influencing the behavior of others around them, animals expend tremendous effort in making their communications effective. Ethologists theorize that communication signals evolve for the mutual benefit of both the sender and the recipient. For example, lost or cold baby chicks that give off high piercing sounds to summon their mothers who respond immediately. Communication behavior can also be used to deceive or tell a lie. For example, if a bird used the there is a hawk signal to fool other birds in fleeing and eats all the food. Other examples are mimicry in butterflies or flies mimicking wasps in attempts to fool predators. Or the anglerfish that wriggles a worm-like bait to attract little fish, exploiting the little fish's tendency to approach worm-like objects. 
Communication behaviors can also exploit the sexual desires of others, such as bee orchids, strongly resembling female bees and inducing male bees to copulate with their flowers as a way of gaining pollination. Or how the female Futurus firefly lures male Fatinus fireflies by imitating the flashing code of Fatinus females in order to eat them. The point is that, as communication behaviors evolve, there's risk for exploitation. Dawkins warns us that selfish exploitation, lying, deceptive practices will arise whenever the interests of genes diverge. There are no good or bad species. Deception may be inbuilt into communication because all interactions involve some conflict of interest. Hence children will deceive their parents, husbands with wives, or siblings with siblings. And this is nature.